and welcome to this strategic analysis video for the November 2020 and February 2021 SEMA strategic case study exam. In this particular video, we're going to be looking at some of the key parts, key models within the SEMA syllabus and applying it to the case, which is a Knowledge City Technology Park. But before we begin, just going to give a very quick introduction into the case itself. And some of you may have looked at the pre-scene already, some of you may not have. But the case that we're looking at is Knowledge City Technology Park, otherwise known as KCTP and referenced as that throughout the case study pre-scene. And essentially it's the technology park industry. It's parks similar to business parks that are specifically there for innovative new startup tech companies. And it's the role of the organization that owns and runs the park to facilitate that innovation and to facilitate the ties with the universities and the potential buyers of the technologies being produced on the technology park, but also providing them with the resources to allow their businesses to grow. Because if there's a tech startup, a few people together with an idea, they probably haven't got the resources available to purchase all the equipment that they need to test their products, etc. So we facilitate it by helping to provide them with the resources that they need. So it's something that is perhaps not going to be that familiar to all of us, particularly as uh, management accountants. Perhaps we've heard of some of these parks, perhaps we've even worked on an organization on one of these parks, but it's not something that a management accountant would necessarily know the ins and outs of automatically. So it's quite an interesting industry for us to take a look at. And a few key points to bring up about the case company to set the context is that it's a publicly traded organization. So trades on the stock market and it's based in a country called Advent, which is a developed country and uh, there are a lot of economic resources, etc. there. And actually KCTP is the largest technology park within Advent. And it's quite an interesting business for us to look at. It's actually a very well run business. And uh, so there's going to be a lot of points that we bring out as we go through the various different models for the syllabus. So how are we actually going to approach this analysis? Well, we're going to use the rational model, and that's going to involve looking at where the organization currently is, where Knowledge City Technology Park is, where it wants to be, what it wants to achieve, where it's heading, etc., and then how it's going to get there. Those are the three parts of the rational model. And what we'll do to identify the now, the future and the business strategy is look at various different things, such as the mission and the values of the organization, the balance scorecard, which is used to audit the progress towards achieving those aims, the governance within the company, the ethics and the corporate social responsibility, what is a critical success factor for KCTP, and also looking at these stakeholders and the expectations and the influence of the various different stakeholders. We'll then look at where the company currently is by looking at the greater environment where it sits in, in the Pestel analysis, Porter's Five Forces to look more specifically at the technology park industry and also summarize the overall position of the company in a corporate appraisal using a SWOT analysis. And then for the final part of the video, we'll look at the business strategy. So looking at where it fits within the generic strategies provided by Porter, looking at potential strategic options for the organization using Ansoft's matrix, how it's going to grow once it's decided upon one of its methods of growth or one of the options that it's going to take. Then looking at overall defining the current strategy of the organization, what it should keep, what it should do going forward. So quite a lot to get through. And we're going to start by looking at the future, where the organization is going. Because, of course, we don't know 
what they're doing they need to do to get to the future if we don't look at the future first if we look at the now first we might think the company is in a good position we don't need to do anything else but we need to ultimately look at where the company wants to be that's the starting point before we start the rest of our analysis because we know where the company is on track and where it needs it to catch up so we'll start by looking at the mission of the organization and the mission is what the company is ultimately trying to achieve what the company is actually about what's the reason for this business to even exist and uh, the mission should be a nice broad statement that provides a common purpose and this common purpose relates to everyone involved with the organization they need to know what the company is about buyers and suppliers and anyone who works with the organization wants to know what that company is about as well what it's ultimately trying to achieve and this is a very useful thing to do because it helps to keep you focused on an end goal. If you are just looking at the current situation the organization is in and you're analyzing different options that the company could pursue, you're not necessarily going to pick the right one if you don't know where the company is heading. You'll just look at each strategic option in the here and now, perhaps which one is going to generate the most money, etc. By looking at the mission statement, you know what the company wants to do. And then you can choose the strategic options that are going to help move the company forwards towards ultimately achieving that aim. So it's a guiding light for new strategies to know what the mission of the organization is. And a mission statement is broken down into four main principles or four main parts according to Campbell's mission statement. There's the purpose, that is why does the organization exist? What does it achieve for? What is it trying to achieve? Why is it there? Well, if we look at KCTP, it exists to facilitate innovation to facilitate the growth of a technology organizations. It exists for small startup companies to give them a chance to build their business. That's the purpose of an organization like Knowledge City Technology Park. The next part is the strategy. How is the organization going to compete? What kinds of businesses is it operating in? Well, of course, for KCTP, the range of businesses operating with it is the technology park industry. But it's not talking about necessarily how they are going to compete. We know why they exist to provide facilitation of innovation, etc. But how does it compete compared to the other technology parks? How does it compete compared to Side Park, which is one of the major competitors mentioned in the pre scene? Then we have the values of the company. What does it stand for? Quality, value for money, innovation. These are things that we need to look at with regards to Knowledge City Technology Park when we're designing our strategies. And if we do look at the precinct, there is a list of values and it talks about integrity, it talks about responsiveness to stakeholders, meeting stakeholders' needs, acting ethically, etc., providing flexibility and innovation. These are all values that should never be compromised on. So that's also the importance of understanding what the company is about, where it's heading, what it's trying to achieve, is to know what you cannot compromise on. So if our organization exists to provide high quality and flexibility in meeting stakeholder needs and acting with integrity, etc., if we're given a strategy potential strategic option in the exam, which goes against all of that, even if it's commercially viable, it's going to make a lot of A dollars, we know that it doesn't go along with our values. That's not the company we want to be. We don't want to be the kind of company that does these kinds of things. That's not integrity. That's not flexibility in meeting stakeholders' needs and responsiveness in meeting stakeholders' needs. That's just pure profit making and that's not ultimately what we are about we are about facilitating growth of uh, organizations through innovation and finally the policies these are things that you would put in place within your organization uh, to uh, ensure 
that individuals are complying with the values, with the strategy, the purpose. Often it'll be in the handbook of new employees, etc. Now we believe in this, we expect all our employees to act in this manner, etc. So based on this information, what can we read into Knowledge City Technology Park's mission statement? Well, the mission statement of KCTP is to provide an open strategic platform for the development of innovation, technology and enterprise. So they exist to provide a platform to help companies, tech companies innovate and uh, grow. So when we think about the purpose, that's the purpose, think about the values, it's about innovation, it's about technological advancement, it's about enterprise turning ideas into commercially viable products. There's no mention necessarily of the strategy there, but that could be incidental for the industry itself. And the way that you compete is by providing the best possible service. So you don't necessarily need to say how you compete because you will naturally compete if you provide a better service for innovation, technology and enterprise. In fact, a reviewer on the UK Science Park Association website stated that 80% of potential tenants ranked the actual platform that they were given as uh, the basically the most important thing in deciding whether to set up their business in a particular technology park. It's what the tech park can bring to their business, the contacts it has, the resources it has to help facilitate the growth of the organization. And what that means for us as the management accountants, the senior managers reviewing at KCTP and working at KCTP, we need to make sure that we are always uh, providing this platform. We're always aiding and facilitating innovation, growth and technology because that is why we exist. Don't go against that. When you are analyzing anything in the exam, you have to make sure that anything you suggest is suitable and ties with the purpose of the organization. Otherwise, you are going off track. So that's the overall mission of the company. That's where the company wants to be, what it's trying to achieve. How do we actually audit the progress of the organization to make sure that we are being innovative? We are providing these platforms. Well, the balance scorecard is a good way of doing this. This is a very important performance measurement tool. And there's no mention in the actual exam of whether they do measure their performance. But if they don't, it's certainly something that they should be doing. It's something that all good organizations do. And the benefit of the balanced scorecard is that it is broad enough. It looks at various things other than finance. Traditional performance measurement looks just at finance. It's too focused on the facts and the figures, etc., rather than looking at general growth and innovation and the efficiency of internal processes and the response from customers, etc. And that's what the balanced scorecard does. It breaks things down into finance, learning, internal and uh, customer. Now, one of the downsides of the balanced scorecard, just to give more of a balanced view, is that sometimes it provides too many metrics, too many things to look at. And therefore, it becomes very difficult to improve on performance because you're looking at too broad a spectrum of measures. So if you've got 100 different things and you think you can improve in all 100, how do you focus on improving 100 different things at once? That's one of the problems of it. But it does provide a good overview. So let's take a look at some of the measures that we could use here at KCTP. Starting with finance, I mentioned that traditional methods are too focused on this, but even with the balance scorecard, we still need to look at it as well, because finance, of course, is very, very important to the organization. The company must generate profit, must provide a return to shareholders, etc., as a listed for profit company. So it needs to measure its finances by the profit that it generates. It actually has a very high profit margin, it's net profit margin over 30%. That is very, very high. So it's doing well in this sense. The return on investment is something that the shareholders will be mindful of as well, how efficiently it is investing its capital assets, a lot of assets at KCTP, over $6 billion in fixed assets. And also cash flow. 
Cash flow is looking at your almost your kind of day to day, week to week, month to month incomings versus your outgoings. And uh, if you are losing more money than you are gaining, even if it's just in the short term, whereas over the course of a year you'll still be profitable, etc., that can cause problems because there are lots of expenses that will have to be paid on a weekly or monthly basis regardless of your cash flow situation. A classic example of that would be wages and salaries for employees. Now you can ask a supplier to push back a payment till you have more money. So yes, we owe you this amount of money, but we're having a bit of problems. Can we pay you next month? That can be agreed on. Can't do that with wages. Can't go to your staff and say, you won't be paid this month or next month, but you might be paid in two months time. It doesn't work like that because they've got things that they need to pay for. They've got mortgages, they've got rent, they've got car payments, whatever it may be. And the reason why I put cash flow here is because it was specifically mentioned as a risk within the pre seed And uh, that particularly when you have tenants that may be our startup companies, there's a high likelihood of them collapsing and therefore they won't be continually paying uh, the rent and the leases for staying on at these sites. And if you suddenly have lots drop out, then that could be problematic for cash flow. Same with regards to the deposits. We hold substantial deposits on behalf of our tenants and that makes up a substantial part of our trade payables. Now, if they were suddenly to fall due and you had five, six, seven clients suddenly leave the park and want their deposits back, that could cause a substantial problem because the trade payables are currently higher than the current assets. And if you look at the current ratio of the organization, it's under one, which means we have more liabilities that fall within a financial year than we have assets that fall within a financial year. So there's a real risk of potential cash flow problems here that the organization might want to do something about. Then the learning perspective, also known as the growth perspective, is look at how you are developing as an organization. And if we look at the kinds of things that the organization wants to do at KCTP, they want to innovate, they want to provide facilitation for innovation through university contracts and uh, contacts and with you know, the bigger companies that are perhaps wanting to purchase the products that are created by our tenant companies, etc. So establishing more of these contacts and putting more innovations in place that help the tenant companies, etc., are very important as the company grows, as the company tries to improve. And then for the internal perspective, this is more to do with uh, not growing and not new things, but how efficiently we're doing our current operations. So examples of this would be the effectiveness of security. Security, a big risk in the uh, pre-scene and spoke about the importance of the security staff and all the different measures they have in place for both physical security and also cyber security. So rating the effectiveness of the security would be a good uh, approach to analyzing its overall internal operations. Also looking at the budgets and whether it's completing tasks under budget, how satisfied the employees are within the organization, its health and safety record, which again was mentioned in the pre scene These are all important metrics for the current operations of the organization. And finally, customer perspective. So looking at our tenants, how many new tenants we get on a regular basis, how many want to stay and renew, you know, that they stay for a few years and some have actually been there for over a decade, etc. So how satisfied they are with uh, what we are providing them here at KCTP. So if you look at all these sorts of measures, you can start setting yourself targets based on that. So for health and safety, for example, you might say that who wants to have a reduction in on-site accidents by 10% by the end of next year, or you wanted to have a 50% you know, tenant retention rate over a two-year basis, and you set specific SMART objectives based on these measures. So that's the balanced scorecard. That's how we analyze our progress, and it would be good for the organization to implement a few of these measures to check that it's on course for meeting its overall goals, its overall purpose that we looked at in the mission section. Now on to governance. Governance is a very, very important topic for the strategic level, very important part of P3. And it's all about running organizations 
in the best possible way, most effective way for the benefits of all stakeholders, which of course is something similar to what we've seen in the pre-scene where it's spoken about meeting stakeholders' needs and being responsive to the needs of stakeholders, etc. So considering its stakeholders is a very important part of what this organization is about. So therefore, it needs to have good governance. And uh, good governance generally includes the uh, following things. I won't go through all of them, but I'll talk through some of them uh, briefly. And uh, this is based on the UK Code of Governance. And uh, the UK Code of Governance sets out a list of things that should be achieved in order to make sure that an organization is being run in the best interests of all uh, stakeholders. And uh, that includes having a separate chairperson and CEO. So the chairperson is at the head of the board and the CEO is the head of the organization. It's important that the two are separate so that one individual doesn't have too much power over the entire organization. It must be independent non-executive directors who are not directly employed by the organization. Their job is to challenge and to question some of the decisions being made by the directors to ensure that everything is being done in the right fashion, everything is uh, being considered, all stakeholders are being considered, etc. Also to have the audit, nomination and remuneration committees These are generally staffed by ex non-executive directors and uh, they're responsible for setting the risk management focus within the organisation. For an audit committee, the nomination committee is there to ensure the right people with the right skills are appointed to the board and the remuneration committee is there to ensure that the directors are fairly compensated for the work that they do because they need to be fairly compensated to the point where they don't think, oh, I'm not getting paid enough here, I'm going to go work at another company. But at the same time, they can't be being paid a huge amount, you know, way more than they deserve because uh, that's not going to look good. Either the public won't like that and also that's not in the interest of the organization itself to be overpaying the directors and part of governance as well is to ensure that risks are being taken care of and that all the different information and financial reporting and controls is all released to the public making sure everyone knows what's going on there are no secrets within the organization it's all transparent and also that all directors are involved in decision making that there aren't the old director that's been put on the board and no one ever asks them their opinion and that they're there just to represent a certain company or represent you know a certain group or anything like that that they are actually actively involved in the decision making process because the board only works if everyone contributes and also good governance involves regular meetings with uh, the shareholders and uh, the senior members of important stakeholder groups and ensuring that there is an annual general meeting where all shareholders, regardless of the level of their holding, can attend. So these are all parts of what make up good governance. So how does this apply to uh, the organization? How does it apply to KCTP? Well, there is a potential for the agency problem at KCTP because the owners are not involved in the running of the organization. There is a representative from uh, the university and the university holds 20% of the shares. It was the original founder, but it's still just a representative of a shareholder rather than it being an actual owner that owns the company outright. And when you don't have an owner that owns the company outright, you have the potential for the agency problem. And this is because people who do not own the company are being employed on behalf of people who do own the company to run it for them. But there's a problem. The directors sometimes often run it for themselves rather than for the owners. If they have certain bonus arrangements in their contracts, if they get sales up to a certain level by the end of next year, they get big bonuses. They might do everything they can to ensure that they get those bonuses to them sure they make that level of profit now of course that may sound like a good thing but it's not necessarily always aligned with the shareholders because the shareholders will want sustainable long-term growth and development of the organization as owners of the company whereas a director might be willing to leverage that longer term sustainability for short term performance just to get their bonuses, then leave, go somewhere else. And then the company is actually left in a bit of a hole because of all the bridges that have been burnt or whatever in order to achieve that short term growth. So there is potential for the agency problem here and the whole purpose of governance is to try and reduce that. 
And uh, there's no specific mention about whether it's a requirement in Adland. Now, a lot of the governance principles have actually been applied by uh, the company, but just because it may not be a requirement doesn't mean they shouldn't do it. In fact, it's only actually required if you are a public company based in the UK. But there are plenty of companies all around the world that are well, the UK code of governance for UK companies, etc. There are plenty of companies all around the world, public and private, that still attempt to adhere to these governance principles because in theory it is the best way to run an organization for all stakeholders. So even if it's not a requirement, they should still be paying attention to it. But it's interesting that it was not mentioned as a requirement because often in a, in a pre-scene it will specifically say the company in, is based in a country and this country adheres to the code of a corporate governance. So what this could mean is that we might be given uh, a question in the exam which would basically reduce the effectiveness of our governance of the company and one of the arguments will be well technically we don't actually have to adhere to the code anyway. But then again, we have to balance that with the fact that it might not be right for the company because it might not be right for the stakeholders. And actually, there are quite a lot of things that have been complied with here. So there are quite a few non-executive directors. There are quite a few board members on the committees, executive directors on the board committees, etc. that are there to provide extra help for decisions. There is a wider experience. There's individuals that have worked in tech companies, individuals that have worked in other industries as well. So it's providing that broader experience. What it doesn't mention is about how things are getting audited though. There was no mention of internal audit charters, etc. There's also no specific mention about the ties with the external auditor, which are there to check the financial statements and the controls. And also no mention about how information is delivered. One of the things that we just saw was that all decisions are made with all the evidence and everyone is involved with it. There was no talk about that, no talk about how the actual decisions are arrived at. And whilst they do have all of the committees, the chair sits on all the committees and generally the same person shouldn't sit on all the committees and particularly the chair shouldn't sit on all the committees because their job is to oversee the board as a whole. And the chair is technically allowed to sit on some of the committees, but they should never chair the committee. If they chair the board, they cannot chair the committee. They can be an attending member of the committee, but not the chair of it, not the head of the committee. And as I mentioned, there was no specific mention of uh, meetings and information, how information is provided to directors, no talk about how they meet with uh, the various uh, different shareholders and institutional shareholders, etc. either. So there is some potential for there to be some governance issues at the organization. But generally, the governance is actually quite good. It's the first time I've seen a company in a pre-scene that's had all four committees, often they're missing one. And it's also not specifically mentioned that it's even a requirement in Adland either. But the fact that they do adhere to a lot of the governance principles is a good thing for the company. It's a strength of the company, particularly with regards to its overall aims, which are to, to exist, to provide innovation and enterprise and to care about its stakeholders, which was specifically mentioned in its values. And good governance is a way of ensuring that. So thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you have enjoyed it and more importantly, you have found it useful. Just going to take a moment to tell you about the courses that we produce here at Astranti for our case studies. And all of the products that you see here are available as standard as part of the course, but they are also available for purchase individually. We have the exam technique series, which is a study text and a video series, which looks at how to plan your answers, how to read the material and analyze the material effectively and to manage your time effectively in the exam, which is incredibly important. Most people who fail the case study exam fail it because of poor exam technique. So that's a really important video series for you to watch to ensure that you've got that technique. There is a specific technique to sitting the case study exam and all will be revealed in that video series. And do head over to the website 
for more information about it. We then have our theory revision series, which again is a study text and a uh, video series. And that looks at these specific theories that are relevant to the case study, because a lot of the material from the E's, the P's, the F's won't appear in the case. There's only specific topics that are frequently tested in the case study. So to save you from revising all the E's and all the F's and all the P's, we've created a more condensed revision series to refresh yourself of the knowledge that you'll need for the exam. We then have our pre-scene analysis series, which looks through the pre-scene page by page, bringing out the important points. In addition to that video series, there is also a video that looks at the top 10 most likely unseen issues and also uh, the strategic analysis video which takes all the key models from uh, the SEMA syllabus and applies them to the case. We then have our industry analysis pack which is a large document that looks at the industry that the pre scene is based on, looks at all the real companies that are actually operating in that actual industry in the real world, looks at how they market, what the suppliers are, what the key stakeholders are, how they operate, industry trends, and also a series of industry examples that you can use and reference in your exam. And we've got sample paragraphs to show you how you would use it in the exam and that's a document there's also an accompanying video with it we have our mock exams which are based on actual exams but they feature the uh, reference to the actual case so they're on the actual case that you will sit the exam on we've done our best to make them as close to the actual exams as possible and you can actually sit those online in an online system that replicates the one that you'll use on the exam day. So you can really test yourself under exam conditions and we provide marking and feedback for those mocks as well, where you'll get a tutor that will analyze your script and will give you a comprehensive document providing you with information, not only on your actual script, as in whether you passed and failed and what you should have brought up and what you shouldn't have brought up, etc. But we'll also give you an appraisal on your technique as well, how to improve your exam technique. We then have our question packs, which is a series of shorter mock style questions based around the core activities. So if you find it that you really struggle with certain parts of the SEMA syllabus, that will be a really good way for helping you for example, if it's the core activity A's that you're always struggling with or the B's that you're struggling with, you can look at the specific core activity A pack, which will give you questions based on uh, those uh, subjects. And then we have our masterclasses. We have two live all day masterclasses, one at the start of the course and one at the end of the course. The one at the start of the course will give you all sorts of hints and tips on how to plan, how to use your time effectively. We'll also go through the planning process live, which will be really helpful for you as you progress into your mock exams. And then we have the revision masterclass right at the end, which looks at everything you've covered. It gives you a refresher on everything you've covered over the six week period. And that's going to be really useful for giving you those little extra hints and tips to get you the extra marks in the exam. So do head over to the website www.astranti.com for more information about those. And uh, I hope to see you again for the next video.